an amazing God, as, as Graham has said. An amazing God that looked down and said, this world needs one of you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful thought? Because we are created in His image and He has knitted us together the way He wants us to be. We don't always function the way He wants us to function, but who we are is the way He wanted us to be. And He said, this world needs one of you. And that needs to warm your heart. That you are destined to be here by God. It's not a mistake, not an accident. And He knitted you together just the way He wanted you to be. And sometimes in life we look at other people and we feel funny in some way because we're not like somebody else or we, I'm not as tall as Eben. Oh, what a game yesterday. Let me not go there. I can't grow a beard like Pastor Martin. I can't grow hair like my wife. And if you're not careful, you can be so running yourself down, looking at each person's strengths, you're taking one of their strengths and you're comparing it to your weakness. God says, you are the way I wanted you to be. How well are you functioning in that? You know, largely through the busyness of life and all the many distractions, we miss out on the fullness of what God has prepared for us. And there's going to come a time when you get to the end of your race, you know, when you start to breathe your last. And you're going to wonder, could I have done this better? Could I have had a better relationship with the Lord? Could I have partnered with God more so that He could achieve more through me? Could I have allowed the Holy Spirit to change me more so that I can have better relationships? Many questions. But we have opportunity because we are not at the end of the race, as far as we know. We don't know if we'll see tomorrow. But to the best of our knowledge, we're not at the end of our race. We still have opportunity to do better. And that is what I want to challenge you on this morning. And I want to challenge you in one very specific direction this morning. But the answer to the question, could we have done better? The answer is yes. Every single one of us could do better. And I was inspired to write a poem for today. It's been a little while since I wrote one of my poems to share with you. And when I write a poem, you are the first people to get to hear it. There was one person who has heard this poem before, other than you. But apart from that... You are the first people that get to hear this poem. And uh, whether you like my poetry or not, well, may the Lord speak to you through the poem, whether you like the poem or not. Um, but may He stir us all to a renewed walk in Him, which ultimately is His desire, that we have a, a renewed walk, a, a, a deeper walk with Him. So the poem is called Walking with God. Our Father in heaven, the one who has made us, Yahweh their name, thy love is upon us. We draw closer today that more we may know you, to delight in your presence and embrace well overdue. We acknowledge our sin and also our failure to obey and trust you and to crucify our nature. Move again within us, stir our desire to holiness. We seek to be more like you, living lives of righteousness. At times we have grumbled and complained at our lot, forgetting the blessings which you have poured out. At times we've been wayward, at times quite undone, at times just as ungrateful as the prodigal son. The truth is, your love far exceeds our failure. Your heart of compassion, sending your son as our saviour. His blood being shed, fully paying the price. For our sin he suffered as a human sacrifice. Forgive us for running and hiding and moping. Teach us to seek you when like Jonah we try escaping. 
We need you, our Father, more than we will ever know. Embrace us afresh and cause your spirit to flow. Now, this poem was partly inspired by our daily readings where we are getting to know God's heart on certain issues such as mumbling and grumbling and complaining. And I don't know how many of you read my daily reading, and if you're not getting it and you want it, please let me know. Send me a WhatsApp and I'll add you. But, you know, the book of Numbers is not necessarily the most exciting book to read. And you might think, oh, I don't even bother reading that. I go from Genesis to wherever, Matthew or wherever it is you skip to, the Psalms. But in this book of Numbers, we've come up with some quite interesting stuff. And I trust that you are picking up on that. I, I trust you are picking up on how God sees mumbling and grumbling and complaining when He's walking with us and pouring our blessings upon us. But God expects more from us because He has invested so much in us. He's invested in us because He wants us to achieve more. He doesn't want us to get to the end of our race thinking, what was that about? What a waste. He wants us to get to the end and we are ready to embrace Him, knowing that we have fulfilled our race. We have achieved that that He gave us to achieve and we are ready to step into His presence. But one area that God desires more of is the way we connect with Him. Our desire to spend time communicating with Him is something for many people that has been eroded over time. And people, because of the busyness, because of the distractions, because of the TikToks and the Facebooks and the, all these other things that can grab your attention, people are spending less and less time connecting with God. I think if there's one thing that differentiates the, the believer from past years to believers of today, it's the prayer life of the individual. And there are obviously exceptions, but by and large, spending time in prayer, which is that which maintains a, a believer's spiritual fervor, the, the, the believer's strength, spiritual strength, it has been eroded. And it has become, to some people, a lost discipline. The less we pray, the weaker we get. And when something gradually fades over time, it is easy for it to go unnoticed and possi possibly unwittingly completely disappear altogether. Not that you set out for that, but it can happen slowly and slowly over time. And there's no prizes for guessing who is a major instigator behind the spiritual degradation. There is one who is opposed to God, who, is, who hates God, who hates everything about God, who hates everyone who loves God. And he will do whatever he can to sever that line of communication that you have to your heavenly Father. We need to be cognizant of this. We need to be fully aware and say, it's not going to happen to me because this is like an umbilical cord. I don't want to be separated from the Father. I want to be connected. I want to be dependent. I want to be receiving from Him. So with somebody that I was communicating with recently, we, we were just sharing a song, uh, and, and it, it just stirred in my heart that I'm going to use this song, and I want you just to listen to the song as we play it now. It's a song many of you probably have heard, but I want it to just wash over you once again. Thank you, Kian. So what do you think the message of that song was? I think it's pretty clear. 
don't stop praying. Maybe you're sitting here and you, you're thinking, I haven't been praying recently. Or maybe you're thinking, I haven't been praying for that particular person or that particular situation, that scenario. I've given up. I prayed for so long and nothing's happened. I've given up. Is that what Jesus teaches us to give up? We don't see the answer? Or does he teach us to press on? To press on with a good heart. Not to press on mumbling and grumbling and complaining because God never does what I ask him to do. Pressing on in the knowledge that he knows. He knows. Sometimes he's waiting for us to partner with him in prayer. To lift up. He wants to see a burden on your heart for that person who's on their way to hell. He wants to see it on your heart. God could save every person on earth. But He wants them to choose to be saved. And some people need prayer cover to come to that point of decision to follow Jesus. It is so hip these days to mock God, to use the name of Jesus in vain, and just to live like the world. It seems to be so in and hip. And when you stand against that, you are so out and ridiculed. You can see the agenda of Satan in this world grabbing people's hearts. Trying to shut you up. Because when you speak, they feel convicted. So if they can stop you speaking and stop you trying to encourage them to move towards God. Then they can run to the edge of that cliff and fall off the edge to their death, feeling comfortable inside. But we're not called to stand by when millions of people like lemmings are throwing themselves off the edge of the cliff. We are called to be watchmen. We are called to speak out. We are called in love to help people. But when the enemy can silence us, and he's got many ways to silence us, but one of his ways is to sever this line of communication between you and the Father. Then you get weaker and weaker, and eventually you don't see any point in even trying. And you just get swept up with the current that is going downstream. Imagine if you won a competition. And the prize was being able to spend time over coffee with any single person alive or even, let's say, even one of time past. Who would you choose to chat to? Single people come up with all kinds of creative ways of getting to speak to the person that they find attractive. Business people... They also come up with all creative ways to get to connect with the decision makers of companies and corporations. People dream of spending time with this celebrity or, or someone of renown. But you are invited to connect not with just a person who's going to fade away like the rest of us, but with the creator of the universe, the one who was before there was a, begin, a beginning and who still will be after the end. The Alpha and the Omega. You are invited and it's not just a casual invitation. It is the heart of God reaching out to you to say, I want to connect with you. Are you, connecting, are you desiring to connect with me? Sometimes in our hearts, when it comes to this, these questions that I've asked, it is as if we are exalting a human being. Maybe David, Moses, Itzabet, whoever. Exalting somebody. We want to spend time. I, want, I would love to have coffee with this one, with that one. But here God is waiting for you to have coffee with him. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. And how casual we can become in our connecting with our God.
Do we recognize what an honor it is to have God who created everything willing to set time aside to spend with you? When we pray, we are connecting with God and we are speaking to Him. Much the same way that Jesus did on many occasions. And if Jesus found the need to connect with the Father in prayer, how much more do we need it? One particular occasion that comes to mind is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Shortly before he was, he was to be crucified, he knew what was coming. He knew the, the challenge, the pain, the... the I, I don't even have words for what Jesus went through. But there was something more that he knew. He knew that he was going to take the sin of the world upon him. And it was going to separate him from the Father. Can you imagine it? Jesus, Son of God, part of the Trinity, having never known a disconnect with the Father, He was about to face that disconnect for you and for me. When He came to this earth, He knew what His ultimate purpose was. It was to die for the sins of the world. But it was a truly daunting task in the flesh, which he'd prefer not to have gone through if there was an alternate. And in Luke 22, he prays saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And we can learn such a lot from that sentence. When we come to God in prayer, we are not trying to convince God to do that which we want Him to do. Jesus didn't come to the Father to say, Father, you've got to change your plan here. This is not working for me. He laid His will down for the Father's will to be done. How often have you come to God in prayer laying your will down that the Father's will can be done. You know, the average prayer of a person these days is a shopping list. Your partner gives you a shopping list. When you're out, please buy these things. Tick, 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 tick. You get the things, you come back. That's how we are with God. God, you must do this, you must do that. And when you finish doing that, you must do this. And if you don't do those things, still stay by your comments. That's how we are with God. Prayer is supposed to be me bearing my soul to the Father, allowing my heart to get in sync with His heart so that I can pray and then go about doing the things that He has for me. That is what prayer is. Jesus is there saying, Lord, if there's any way possible, take this away. But... Not my will, your will be done. Such a simple little sentence, a simple little prayer. But there's such a, a lot that we can extract from. And I think that this misguided understanding of prayer is possibly a major contributing factor to people praying less than what they used to. Factors, the tougher things get, and things are getting tougher, the more prayer is needed. Just because you've been praying for a child for however many years, or you've been praying for this, that, or the other, and you haven't seen the outcome, don't stop praying. And when you pray, you pray in faith. And when you pray, you are seeking to align your heart with the Father's heart. We're not seeking to run off on a tangent to achieve something outside, totally different to what God is looking for. We are aligning our hearts so that we know how to pray, so that we know how to speak into somebody's life. Us trying to do more in our strength is not the answer. The answer 
is more of God's enabling power and God's favor over us to accomplish that which is needed. For Pastor Sharon to interact with the Department of Social Development is not more of her cleverness, more of her whatever. It is more of what God wants in that situation. It is more of the Holy Spirit to flow through her and to influence hearts. It's more of the Father's will to come in that can be done in our country. Because any country without God is a lost country. And more and more around the world, even in what used to be historically Christian countries, they are chucking God out. They are chucking God's word out. And guess what? When you have a spiritual vacuum, it doesn't stay a vacuum for long. It starts to suck in other spiritual forces. If you chuck God and the Holy Spirit out of your home, your workplace, your, your country, guess what comes in to take its place? Jesus didn't give up on the Father because he had to go through the crucifixion process. I want you to catch that. Jesus didn't give up saying, this is not what I want. Jesus' heart was broken because of the broken distance, the broken connect with the Father for that time. His heart was broken. His heart was wanting to reconnect. I don't know if your heart has been broken and you have disconnected from God because of the pain, the disappointment, the whatever. Something you had to endure which you didn't want to endure. We all say we want to be like Jesus. But when we have to walk through situations like Jesus had to, then we go, oh, no, 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 I don't want that. I just want to look like Jesus. When we say, Lord, make, I want to be more like you, it's quite a big thing to say. And we need to be able to step in and say, Lord, this, this isn't ideally what I wanted, but not my will, your will be done. Jesus submitted to his Father. He submitted his very life to the Father, even though it's not what he would have preferred to have in the flesh. Spiritually, he recognized the bigger picture. He had vision for the end game. But in the flesh, that's not what he wanted to go through. What happens to your prayer life? When you need to go through stuff that you prefer not to have gone through. Do you give up on God? Do you turn your back on Him? Don't stop praying. I want you to think about it. How do you function when it doesn't go your way? How do you respond to God when that which you wanted doesn't happen? Or that which you wanted to happen doesn't happen? That which you didn't want to happen does happen? And it seems to all go wrong. How do you function? Do you give up? Search your heart on it. Be honest with yourself. You don't have to answer me. My job is to stir you to a greater relationship with the Lord. I stir you to check your heart. I stir you to challenge you so that you can look at yourself. Please don't think I am preaching at you. I'm just trying to stir you the way God stirs me when I put these things together. I go through twice as much as what you go through as God works this within me as I deliver it for you. Many of you have prayed for children, not to have children, I mean prayed for children who are maybe not functioning the way they need to function. Many of you have prayed for Healing for certain things. There's many kinds of prayers that we can pray. Finances. And maybe you haven't seen the expected results yet. My counsel, don't stop praying. And when you pray, you pray in faith. Believing. It doesn't help to pray and think, oh, well, this isn't going to happen. But anyway, let me just pray it anyway because the pastor said so. Embrace it in your heart. If it's not working in your heart yet, get before the Lord. Say, Lord, this is my heart. Be honest with God. This is my heart. I don't think this situation's ever going to change. 
But help me, because I need it to change. Help me to see the change. Help me to be speaking into the change. Help me to be praying towards that change. And help me to be trusting in you for that change. God doesn't want you just in your own strength trying to do something. God wants you submitting to Him and Him flowing through you and doing it. Because that is what's going to bring Him the glory. But your first step to get him back to praying for the things that you've given up on is to submit your expected results to the Father. Submit them to the Father. The way Jesus did. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Settling in your heart this that we learned from Jesus. Not my will, but yours be done. That's the first part. Let us settle that in our hearts between us and God. Lord, this is my case. I am bringing my case before you, but not my will, yours be done. Can you imagine how much success we would see if we were praying that which God wants to happen instead of what I want to happen? Because God will always empower for that which He is ordaining. He always pays for the pizzas that he orders. And it's not to say that you need to take on a no-care attitude or I don't care what happens, you know, like a teenager. You try to help a teenager and you get that, well, I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. That's not how we are to be with God. God is very interested in your well-being. He hears your prayers. He wants to help you. He wants to partner with you. Align your heart with his Allow Him to flow through you. Allow Him to give you the desires of your heart. It's an interesting scripture, that, isn't it? That God will give you the desires of your heart. We always think of it, oh, the desire in my heart, I have these desires. But turn it around and just think of it a little different. That God will give you the desires of your heart. Imagine if your heart was full of the desires of God instead of the desires of this world. Delight yourself in the Lord. Not delight yourself in the world and all the worldly stuff in your heart God will give you. No, no, no. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. The key is in delighting yourself in the Lord. How much have you been delighting yourself in the Lord recently? Or is your delight in other things? Worldly things. It's not to say you can't enjoy things in life. God gives you things to enjoy. You might have a nice house. Hallelujah. A blessing from the Lord. You might have a nice car. Hallelujah. A blessing from the Lord. But if your heart is in those things instead of in Him, then you have misappropriated the blessing and you have made it your God. And then you're missing the plot. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Have you considered the possibility that that thing that you were so earnestly praying for that God hasn't given to you yet, that maybe God has got something better for you, something that will work better for you, something that will be better for you long term that you, than what you have your eyes fixed on. God knows. You might be a young person. I remember as a teenager, I think the day I turned... I think in those days you could get your learners at 17, I think, when I was young. I can't, it was so many centuries ago, it's hard to remember. But the, pretty much the week that I turned the age of getting a learner, I got it. And the week I could get a, a, a driver's license, I got it. It was the greatest delight for me to get a driver's license. And of course, if you have a driver's license without a vehicle, that doesn't really work so well. So as a young person, then you have a desire for a vehicle as well. But you've got no money, so it's a pretty tough kind of situation. You might be that young person desiring to buy their first car. And you've got your heart set on 
Which car? Oh, remember a few weeks ago? Your 1979 Opel Menta. 1600. And the salesperson has convinced you that this is the greatest buy. This is the greatest investment that you could make. And you set your heart on that vehicle. And you pray for that vehicle. And it doesn't happen. And you get angry with God. And you get upset with God because you want this car. And all the while, He is saving you from a financial burden that you could never cope with because of the kind of maintenance that's going to be needed and the unavailability of spare parts and all of these challenges. But in your heart, you want this thing. We need to submit those things to the Lord. Say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because God has a greater foresight than what you could ever imagine. It's easy to get wrapped up in things and to get excited about a thing. So much so that you want it. So much so that you, you make bad decisions to get it. And God says, I've got something better for you. My son, chill out on this thing. I don't know if God says chill out, but chill out on this thing. I've got something for you. Not my will, but yours be done. Instead of getting upset with God because he didn't do what I wanted him. I told him I wanted this. And he hasn't done it. That's how we are sometimes. Take out your little rub, rub that uh, lantern and pew, 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 out comes a blue genie. Ready to give you your three wishes. That's how we, that's how we look to God. In the meantime, the creator of the universe, the one who's going to sit on the, the great white throne judgment seat, one day you'll know. One day you'll see God for who He is. He's a whoa, I'm sorry, Lord. There's no blueness in you. There's no, none of this funniness. He is God. He is God Almighty. And He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to speak to Him. He wants you to hear from Him. He wants you to be led by Him. What an honor. What a privilege. This is not the time to stop praying, folks. This is exactly the time to start praying afresh. But you say, oh, I've been praying for years. I've not seen the answer to my prayers. This is the time to start praying with new vision, with new strategy, with new spiritual wisdom, with new fervor. We are in end times, folks. Don't give up praying now. Press on. The finish line is before us. Don't give up. I'm convinced that sometimes God can get so frustrated with our prayers. Our prayers that revolve solely around our worldly wealth and our me, myself, I focus. And here's God. Sure. And he can see the beginning from the end. He's saying, that's bad for you. You don't need that. I've got this for you. We need to submit that will of ours to the Father. We are his sons and his daughters, and we're being birthed to help him to accomplish that which he wants to happen on earth, like Pastor Sharon with the babies. Looking after babies is a ministry that flows through her veins. It's what she was birthed to do, to care for those babies who are outcasts, who have got no one to look after them, no one to love them, no one to care for them, no one to stand up for them, no one to speak for them. She is the voice of the voiceless. And she doesn't back down for anyone. Even for government departments, she stands up against them. And it's not easy. It takes its toll. And that's why she's saying, folks, I need prayer. Let us pray. Let us be diligent in our prayers. But we are being created in God's image for His purposes. 
how come we are so easily distracted from our primary mission in life. We've been sent as a, like a secret service agent. I've got a mission. Oh, and there's a squirrel. Oh, isn't that a pretty squirrel? Distracted, just like that. Discouragements, challenges, seemingly impossible situations, all of these things just distracting us from, from the purpose of, of why we were put on earth. What is your impossible, I need a miracle, as the song that I played for you just now said? Each one of you has an impossible where you need a miracle. What is yours? Does it align with the Father's will? Is your impossible you can't afford that latest Ferrari? You need a miracle to get it. Because is that really God's, you know, if God had to give you, what does a Ferrari cost? I don't even know. Five million rand, let's say. If God had to give you five million rand, do you think he'd want to spend it on a car? On a car that needs hectic maintenance? I can't even imagine the insurance of that thing. Or was God, do you think God might have another idea for you spending that money? And we need to put it aside say, Lord, not my will. Your will be done. What is this money for? What have you given it for? You have an impossible situation, but we need to align those things with God's heart. And we do so in prayer. We do so by spending time and allowing our heart to sink. It's almost like plugging to, you buy, a, here's a, you buy a new phone. Your biggest concern is, hey, I've got a lot of stuff on my old phone. No problem, sir. We plug it in and we put it all across. You need to plug into God and you need Him to download His heart into your heart so that His purposes and His will can become your purposes and your will. But we all have impossible situations in our lives, areas which we just don't have the answer. It could be a financial, as I've said. It could be a health. It could be a relational challenge. But challenges, they are. And challenges, they will be. Have you given up on even bothering to pray into that situation because it's been there so long? Has it been there so long you've just resigned to it? Say, well, this is my lot. God says, I'm not done yet. I'm not done but I need you to be on board. I need you to align your heart with mine so that together we can do this thing. I'm not finished helping you yet, he says. I need you to partner with me on it. We need to get back to that which we know is right. You know, in this day and age, there are so many new things. A lot of them are distractions. You know, if you were buying... Here's an example. Sorry, sometimes the Lord just gives me pictures as I'm speaking. In, when I left school, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know what I wanted to do when I was in school? I wanted to get out of school. Really. I did not enjoy school. Not one bit. You know, when you think back, you oh, I could have done so much better. Hi. But we need to learn from that and do so much better in other things that we have control over. But I did not have the greatest school life, I must say. It was, uh, not the greatest time of my life. So when I left school, I had no vision, I had no direction. My parents didn't have money to finance anything, to give me, you know, send me to varsity or anything. They'd already sent my brother. He became a, a metallurgist. By the age of 20, he was a metallurgist. He was the brain box of the, of the household. And then came me. Sorry for you. So I got a job at Photocats. I'd been working there Saturday mornings, trying to earn a little bit of money. And I started selling hi-fis at first, and then I also included cameras later. But, you know, in hi-fis, there's no, there's no limit to what you can spend. You know, you might think, wow, I bought a nice hi-fi, it cost me 5000 Well, you know, you could buy a speaker for 500000 or $5 million if you want. There's no limit to what you can spend on hi-fi equipment. But what I learned... The more expensive the equipment, the more basic it looked. If you just got a black box with one or two dials, that thing was probably a hundred million rand. And then you get another thing with a gazillion lights 
And all things, have, and, and that's like 500 bucks. And sometimes in life we get distracted by the flashing lights and, ooh, look at this, isn't that great? And we miss out on the depth of the sound, on the fullness and the crispness of the sound because we got distracted by flashing lights. The enemy has many flashing lights, many things to try and pull you aside. You're driving down the road and... You've got your eyes on the road and there's a lovely cloud formation or a nice sun. Ooh, isn't that beautiful? It's not, a, it's not wrong to admire it. But, you know, if you admire it for 30 seconds, you might find yourself driving into a pole. We need to stay focused, folks. And we need to achieve that which God put us on this earth to achieve. But you know what he says in Jeremiah 6.16? Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see. And ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. You see, the flashing lights and all the new shiny glittery stuff, it might get your attention. But there's something better. Even in churches these days, you know, there's a lot of fancy stuff with smoke machines and lights and all kinds of things which I... See a substitute for the Holy Spirit. If the Lord wants to fill this place with the smoke of His presence, hallelujah, Lord, we are open for that. But I don't want to artificially make stuff. You feel, oh, God's here. Look at this. Look at this smoke. If this place ever fills with smoke, you must know it's God's smoke. <laughs> there's no gimmicks. There's nothing. There's nothing. I, I have never seen an angel. I know oh, Gabby, bless her soul, often... From, let me rather say, from time to time, she'll say, I saw an angel as you were standing. It was this, that, the other. I've never seen an angel. See, Gabby has been blessed with the gift of being able to see into the spiritual realm differently to uh, how I see into the spiritual realm. If I ever tell you I saw an angel, you must know I saw an angel. I'm not one to say something just to try and impress you. I, will tell, I haven't seen an angel. God is wanting us to get back to the solid things, to the proper things. Not to be distracted by flashing lights and whatever else is, is used, but to seek His heart and to connect with Him. These days, it's very popular amongst people to seek the new thing. What is the latest thing? There's got to be something latest, otherwise you are. Well, the latest is that Jesus died for you. He shed his blood so that you can be forgiven and you can spend eternity with him. If that is not enough for you, then you need to find a social group that is doing other things. But as for me and my household, we serve the Lord. We don't serve gimmicks. These ge the generations of today, they're always seeking the latest, the newest. Someone has a, they put a spin on a scripture that is, distorts that scripture so much, bringing a totally different meaning. And wow, this guy is the greatest preacher. He's got new revelation. And meantime, he's just got doctrine of demons. Be careful not to be distracted. Seek the old ways. Seek my ways, God says. It is the devil who comes with the flickering lights and the glitter and the glamour and the celebrity and all of that stuff. We seek Jesus. That's who we seek in this church. These days you point people to Scripture. They feel, ah, oh, there's a new way of doing things. Scripture's old, it's outdated. We've got new ways. Mm, yeah, I know your new ways. Turning your back on God's word as being old fashioned and not with it. Do you know what God's word is not with? It's not with new age thinking, it's not with pagan practices, it's not with satanic agendas. It's with a Father who loves you, and He loves you so much. 
that he sent his son to lay down his life for you. This is the message of God. This is the message of his word. But what do they say to God's word? They say, we will not walk in it. They reject God as they reject his word. God's word hasn't changed, folks. It's up to you to choose whether you walk in it or not. But as a church, God is calling us to seek the old paths, not to be distracted by the, the latest and greatest with bells and whistles and everything else. He is the ancient of days. You don't need a new God. The presence of His Spirit was with the Israelites as it is with us here. You don't need any substitute with smoke and mirrors. Jesus' as example of mankind needed to connect with their Father in heaven is not outdated. It is not a waste of time as the enemy would have you believe. It is what God is calling you to do. And no matter how discouraged you've become in your prayer life, it's time for refreshing. For the refreshing showers of God to fall down upon you. And this is my prayer. This is what I am seeking for you as a people. Failing to pray can be compared to failing to plan. Both have disastrous results and can result in you missing out on God's best for you. So let's commit to digging deep and getting back into practice of prayer. You know, if you skip doing your exercises or skip going to gym for a few weeks, you eventually lose your momentum and it can be quite hard to get back into. And it's the same with prayer life. But it is well worth it. You need to flex those spiritual muscles in prayer so that they can be used to working again. You need to determine to start again and to commit to a daily connecting with God and bringing Him afresh into each and every day. Test me on this and see if it makes a difference or not. If you need to dig deep, then you dig deep. That's how it is. But whatever you do, do not stop praying. And that is my message for you this morning. And Lord, I lift this congregation up to you as we go into a time of worship. And I speak refreshing rivers, refreshing fall of rain upon them that will collect and become a river. Refreshing waters from above, Lord. To refresh us in our relationship with you and in our desire to connect with you. We praise you, Lord. Would you come and move about us and within us as we enter into this time of worship now in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. The all-powerful name of all authority. And we get to wear it. We wear your name with pride, Lord. We worship you. I speak your blessing upon this congregation, Lord. I speak a new release of refreshing rivers of water to wash through their lives, wash through their hearts, their minds. Refreshing rivers, Lord. From, a, from the throne room. And may you just open the floodgates of heaven, Lord. As people look to you in, in prayer, Lord, would you just open the floodgates of heaven and pour out your provision, your healing, whatever it is that is needed in that situation, you know, Lord, you know. Draw near to your people, Lord. Draw near and bless them, I pray, in your precious name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.